Have fun plans for the outdoors? Make the memories last with the best outdoor coolers and drinkware. Celebrating 10 years of cool, Orca was founded in 2012, born from the idea of making a hard-sided cooler that beat out all the rest. Orca coolers are built to be as strong as the adventures you take them on. That's why they have a lifetime warranty while giving you world-class maximum temperature retention. Orca's drinkware offers the same high quality, keeping your drinks icy cold or hot for hours, and they look great while doing it. Their stainless steel vacuum-sealed tumblers and martini cup are perfect companions for your next outdoor adventure. Go to orcacoolers.com backslash bourbon for 15% off your order. That's orcacoolers.com backslash bourbon for 15% off. Orca, make it last. Hey, y'all, I want to let you know we've teamed up with our friends at PickShop.com. They have an app, the Picks app. It is a new awesome thing that we're we're moving a lot of our stuff to. We're moving tastings there. We're moving posts there. We're not going to leave Instagram and Facebook and all the other places, but Picks is this really cool thing that we're getting to build with them. We're getting to build how you post. We're getting to build how you go ahead and put in a tasting, and these tastings will match you up to other people and other whiskeys that you are very compatible with based off of what you've put in for your tastings. There's so much stuff. I can't even tell you enough in a minute, but go to pickshop.com, hit the link, get the app, get in there, start tasting, start posting, be a part of the community. We're going to be there. You should be there too. Go to pickshop.com and get the app. What's going on, Mr. Baker? Oh man, just uh, trying to keep my, the top of my head above water. I don't even say my whole head, just trying to keep air flowing cool well, i got something else is why do you keep respond oh that's don't ask me a normal question when i say what you got for me like you said what's going on oh. tonight so I, I answered the question okay what you got for me zeke baker let's try this again i mean 400 plus episodes and then you get up and blame me i just say a question for you i don't need to say what's the haps what's going on how are you what's up said, what you got i would have known what to go with you said What's going on tonight? I thought you were asking me a legit question, but then you're just going to roll into the, well, what's your open for the night? Like, I was ready to go. If I ask you any question to start the show, you're supposed to go into your shit after. That's how this works. Like, it could be, how are you? What color is the sky? Like, whatever what it is. How was your dinner? I mean, shit. That's a question. <laughs> it's a, yes, go into your cold open after, how's your dinner? Like, did you enjoy supper? Dumbass. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is John Edwards. With me, as always, is Zeke Baker. And together, we make the Dad's Drink of Bourbon. Wherever you are, whatever time it is, thank you for making us part of your day. You should know that this guy must be very important because normally, you've probably noticed a little trend. Zeke Baker is on assignment for most of the interviews lately. He's here tonight. And that might be not only because this guy is way cooler than we are, but the other thing is that we are picking a barrel tonight that will be a distro pick in Nashville, Tennessee for off hours. And because of that, Jake Ireland, the owner and the founder of Off Hours is on. Jake, welcome to Dad's Drinking Bourbon. Thank you, guys. I appreciate the uh, the opportunity. I do have to say one of the funniest things is when I remember we got the sample of Off Hours like way back. It's It's been a minute. And I remember we looked at the website and we looked at just all the branding around Off Hours and we were like, we're not cool enough to drink this. This brand, like the <laughs> The way you have the branding, it's like, you know, somebody on a random deck in the middle of the desert, like in a white button down shirt, cool sunglasses, holding a bottle of bourbon. And I'm like, man, we're not cool enough for this. <laughs> Speak for yourself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and then you find out, like, I've been talking to Jake and it's like, yeah, he's total dad life too. Like he's Californian dad life, but total dad life too. And it's like, all right, maybe we are cool enough to drink off hours, exactly. you know, like. Yeah. Don't tell yourself short, you know. <laughs> But I was like, this brand is not going for like a 38 year old male. And then it's like, oh, wait, Jake's only a couple years younger than me. Never mind. I guess we <laughs> can all drink it. 100%. We're trying. I don't know. We get a lot of 38 uh, year old females that are drinking it now, too. So that's that's one of the, the biggest uh, key points, I think, that we weren't even going for that is working. So we'll, we'll, we'll take it. 
it is kind of the branding. I mean, it is the the messaging, right? A lot of the bourbon is the same. You all source it. And we're going to get into the whole story about that. But if you're selling the same juice as other people, it's like, well, how are you selling it that ends up determining if they're going to come over and drink your stuff? So or I think that has a lot that plays into it. I think that it's also the messaging. You're kind of like, what are you doing off hours? Like, this is your off hours time. This is your time to relax. This is your time to enjoy a pour. You're off. And I think people like hearing that they're off. A hundred percent. And that was, yeah, that was, we'll, we'll get into it. But I think that, you know, when we landed on the name off hours and was like, holy shit, like everyone has off hours. Everyone comes from different, you know, backgrounds and walks of life and careers and, and, you know, my off hours versus yours versus Zeke's or anybody's, you know, might be a little bit different. And, you know, how you choose to spend them is, is, sort of up to you. And, uh, you know, I think that the way everything is right now with having your phones and your screens and, you know, everything that we were talking about before with the kids and stuff too, your off hours are are, are sort of dwindling, or at least mine are. Um, (laughs) So it's taking advantage of those few moments here and there and and trying to enjoy them and, and, you know, build some lasting memories with it. So yeah, that was something that we felt early on would be uh, a differentiating factor for us that we could, uh, we could, we could really run with. Love it. And I also love, I've been holding everything in for, you know, because I always tell people that the 30 minutes before and Zeke normally shuts up then too, but I tell them a little bit about me. So like they at least feel they know who they're interacting with and all, and I'm it's like, Hey, I'm not going to talk about it once we hit the record button and we're going because it's all about Jake at this point. But the funny thing is I got hurt playing football my freshman year of college. Jake got hurt playing baseball the freshman year of college. And like, there's so many things that I I was holding back because I'm like, all right, don't let it go now. Like, wait for the podcast to talk to Jake about this. <laughs> yeah. But tell me about your story. Tell me how you got to off hours itself because you were damn near close to becoming a physical therapist. Yeah, yeah. This is a very roundabout kind of convoluted way how I got here. But, you know, I, so I, I started, you know, I grew up in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. So a few miles down the road from from MGP. A lot of family, friends, relatives that all worked at MGP over the years. So back, you know, when it was Seagram's and various different uh, jobs, I guess, uh, they they were sort of there. And um, so I knew about it, kind of was around it quite a bit as far as bourbon and just the alcohol industry. Never, you know, really thought a whole lot about it. But yeah, I went to college, played baseball, freshman year, fall ball, had a rotator cuff injury, basically... You know, I had work done and and kind of decided that, you know, that as I was rehabbing and kind of everything that I thought college baseball was going to be (laughs) wasn't necessarily it, you know, and at the time, you know, I really kind of decided that I wanted to sort of the experience of physical therapy and and kind of rehab and all that stuff going through it that I sort of wanted to go into that sports medicine field. And so I ended up transferring to IU Went to school for, for exercise science and kinesiology and then uh, graduated and went on and got my doctorate in physical therapy. You know, really had my kind of mindset on I wanted to open up clinics where it was sort of a one stop shop for elite athletes, whether it was, you know, youth, high school, collegiate, professional athletes to come in and really have your physical therapist, your doctors, your nutritionist, you know, really kind of everyone there under one roof that could you know, hopefully keep you healthy and and keep you at the top of your game. And the last uh, rotation I had in the uh, doctorate program, the the boss that I had at the time was working in an account that he had created that was working with a ton of professional athletes. And he basically told me, he was like, you know, look, I understand this is what you want to do, but it's not what you think it is. And sort of like really kind of painted the picture for me of like, this is what the day to day is. And it's, not all, you know, you think it's cracked up to be. So it really kind of planted that seed in my mind that, you know, I wish I would have learned six, seven years prior. Ended up, I got out, uh, I was living in Phoenix at the time. My wife, uh, now, you know, we went to IU together. She was working for an ABC affiliate in Missouri uh, during the morning news there. And we decided that we were either going to move to Chicago or we were going to move to LA after I finished up school and she was kind of ready to get into a new net or a new, you know, a new city as well. Yeah. We, we spent like a couple of weeks in Chicago during the winter and we're like, absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it is way too fucking cold to be here. So we, uh, yeah, we decided on, on LA. She, she'd had a lot of family out here. Um, so we, we got out here in, in uh, 2012, 
you know, I've been here ever since, but, uh, you know, I, I was licensed to practice in California, pretty much immediately put my license on hold and decided to, you know, go a different career out and had an opportunity to work for a family office early on that was doing, they, they did more private equity, more bigger, you know, deals that I knew nothing about. Uh, but they were saying, you know, look, we get a ton of early stage opportunities, uh, you know, kind of venture back deals that come across our desk. It's not really our forte, but we might be missing out on some opportunities that we don't even know. So sort of got a, a street MBA and kind of just learned on the fly, you know, the ins and outs of venture investing and, and that whole sort of thing. And there was a bourbon brand that some guys I knew were bringing to market that had some experience on the sales and distribution side. So they were looking for barrels and was able to help them source barrels through MGP and kind of do some work behind the scenes. You know, really started to learn a lot more about the industry as a whole beyond kind of some of the stuff that I'd learned early on from family. You know, we had the brand for a few years and we had the opportunity to sell it and we did, and this was like 2017, and uh, you know, we all walked away, you know, fairly happy. And I just felt like there was a little bit of a missed opportunity where I think if we had known some of the um, early hurdles you can trip over uh, by you know starting your brand and what all the boxes are that you need to check, I think it could have been a lot different. But um, you know, I, I started to kind of kick the tires a little bit on what if I did this again and sort of take those lessons learned and uh, apply them to something new. You know, really my wife was like, look, you've been talking about this for a long time. Why in the hell are you not like, you're a broken record right now. Like either fucking do this or not. <laughs> it's like, all right. Uh, so, you know, decided to, to kind of pull the trigger on it and um, went back to MGP. And, you know, at the time everybody, you know, MGP, everybody's sourcing from it. And like you said earlier, you know, what's your differentiating factor and what do you got to do? And, and really mine was like, you know, look, I want to be transparent about it. I want to, I want people to know that it's coming from MGP, um, you know, that I grew up there, that my family's there and sort of shine some light on it, that there's a lot of really good brands that are sourcing from them that may or may not always, you know, be as transparent about sourcing it or what they're doing. And, and sort of, for me, it was just like, I'm going to leave it be, uh, you know, and it is what it is. And if people like it, great. If they don't, then, you know, we're not the brand for them. And, um, you know, the other idea of it all was, was really kind of creating a brand that was a little bit outside the box from a lot of other bourbon brands that are out there and sort of getting away from a lot of the the kind of family heritage background and, and the regionality of the grains and water and, and that whole sort of thing. And, and trying to hit a little bit more of a younger demographic and a little bit more kind of maybe newcomer to bourbon or a little more casual bourbon drinker versus, you know, the folks that really do understand the ins and outs of the industry. Yeah. You know, so we started working on it and, uh, that was like early 2018. Yeah. It was ready to go in early 2020 and the whole world shut down. So, <laughs> uh, pumped the brakes pretty quick, uh, quickly on that and pushed it off for about seven, eight months or so and, and sort of re, uh, tailored the strategy a little bit for our launch plan and, and, and got it out in, in October of 2020. So we uh, we just just hit the two uh, two year anniversary, I guess, of being in the market and uh, you know expanded markets uh, you know over those two years and and um, got another the, the single barrel you know that we'll do the pick here and everything too that we just launched uh, um, you know about a year or so ago too maybe a little less than that and. Um, yeah, can't complain. Everything's been it's been a lot of fun. One of the crazy things, I can't even remember all the pandemic brands. I just talked to a brand, we released a podcast today. They started an RTD company in the middle of the pandemic and it's so funny cuz everybody I felt like started drinking more. When you're hanging out on whiskey Instagram or like Facebook or whatever and all you're doing is seeing people drink, obviously you think people are drinking more. So it's like what better time to go start a brand, but it's also it's hard because you don't get to do that activation type stuff like you would normally do where you're actually going to meet the distributor. You're yes, these all turned into zoom calls, but it's like, you're not going and touching them and like shaking their hand and having them see you and kind of like, like Jake Ireland. It's you have to do it virtually. It's completely different, isn't it? I would say like the strategy we had early on was definitely more like, you know, more social media, more digital, sort of applying some of the stuff that you're seeing from other like DTC brands that are outside of the alcohol industry. At the end of the day, the alcohol industry is what it is. And it is very 
relationship driven and it is very, you know, hands on and, and being there in person and building those relationships, you know, goes a long way to, to getting respect in the industry, getting attention from your distributors and from retailers. And to your point, like not being able to get that, you know, that in-person opportunity, you know, was tough. And I think that we were lucky enough to, to kind of get our foot in the door in the right spots around Indiana and around Kentucky to start. And then for Southern California, you know, we had, everything was shut down. Restaurants were shut down. There was no such thing as putting your bottle on the back bar because the back, the bar wasn't even open or the restaurant wasn't open. So we had to kind of really find ways where restaurants were doing to go deliveries, carry out type of cocktails. So we were finding ways to partner with those restaurants that were kind of on brand with us. And, and, you know, we did a ton of social media and bourbon 101 zoom type of stuff. And it was really kind of just showing, showing the distributors that like, Hey, here's what we're doing. And, you know, it's different. People are at home drinking now. They're not, you know, they're not going to dinner and not grabbing happy hour, but here's how we're able to get to them. And by sending little cocktail kits and getting in with the drizzlies and the go puffs and everybody in the world to, you know, make it convenient. Yeah. It was just trying to kind of take advantage of a lot of the new stuff that was you know, that was around, but people weren't necessarily as aware of it until everything shut down. And it was like, well, you know, I still want to have a drink and I still want to do this. Like how in the hell, you know, do I do this? And so it was trying to honestly think about it as ourselves of like, look, if I had nothing to do with a brand, like, what do I want? It's like, well, you, everybody was a nervous wreck to go to the grocery store or what, one in, one out. And I was like, this is such a nightmare. What can we do? And it's like, all right, well, let's think through the delivery side. Let's think through what we're doing for dinner and what we're doing for lunch, happy hours that whole sort of thing and try to play to what we thought was going to appease everyone. I think you did okay. And did you say this already? Originally, the stuff that you got was all MGP, right? Yeah. So all MGP, it's a 75 corn, 21 rye, 4%. So, you know, really, really kind of their bread and butter, their standard mash bill. When I bought the barrels from them, they were about two and a half years old. So they were like November, November and December fill dates of 2015. So when I started working on the brand, I knew that I wanted to wait till, you know, really four to five years. So I was like, well, I got about a year and a half to maybe two years or so before, you know, we put this in the bottle. You know, it ended up being about five, a little over five years once, or about five years on the dot, really, when we when we did everything. And now everything's about five and a half years old. It goes into the everyday product and, and just shy of seven years for the, the single barrel. And is that all MGP still? I notice you're wearing a hat. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, the hat has nothing to do with it, though. Okay. So. <laughs> that that hat will just remain a mystery for everyone yeah. and just know that uh it's a cool yeah. hat. I like your hat. Thank you. I appreciate that. You know, so everything is MGP, but yeah, the hat was um some conversations we were having with them at uh, or still continue to have, but things have been put on on hold a little bit as there's been uh some other stuff going on with them and, and another distillery that uh Yeah, they're yeah, busy. They're uh, busy. The back, back runner for a little bit, yeah. <laughs> So were these barrels from the original brand that was sold off in 2017 and then you just held on to the barrels or? No, you stuff? know what? Yeah. So the, the original brand, they were using the 45% wheat that uh, MGP had produced. And honestly, it was really, really good juice. It was just really young at the time when we brought it to market. And when we sold those barrels, we actually sold them to a distillery in Columbus, Ohio the Middle West there as they were kind of jumpstarting their production. And I reached back out to them and asked, you know, when I started thinking like, okay, I'm really going to do this. I wanted to get those barrels back. And they were like, absolutely not. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Which the funny thing now, the funny thing now though, is that Middle West is a contract distiller. So who right. ever would have guessed that like it all comes full circle? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I still remember. I'm like, all right, this is gonna be perfect. Like, I don't know why we sold. I wish I would have known that. Uh, you know, I was gonna do this. We would have held on to those barrels, and, and it would just made things so much easier. I'm like, I know I'm gonna, you know, probably overpay for them, but it was great juice. And then, yeah, they were me like, no, nope, like, there's, there's not even a conversation to be had about this. So the MBA and you know venture capitalist stuff. It's like, man, buying a uh, MGP barrels and. 2017 ish versus trying to get them in 2020 ish. Yeah, I feel that was a pretty steep grade, and uh, you almost <laughs> had to kick yourself in the ass at least once a day of like 100. I had these in my hands, like like yeah. they were mine, and I let them go. Like f me, 100. <laughs> percent Yeah, I was just slamming my head in the door, like you got to be kidding me. Like, 
<laughs> but you know, it ended up uh, it ended up all right. You know, at the time, you know, when I got a hold of these barrels, the, the twenty one rye, I was like, all right, like it was just such a different taste profile than than you know what I had spent the last three four years working on with the wheat. But it was good. You know, I, I worked with Ashley Barnes. You know, she had been with Buffalo Trace and, and with Four Roses and then it kind of it recently went out on her own. So I brought her in. You know, we went through probably shit, 17, 18, 19 different blends or taste profiles that we worked on and, and proofs and what where we wanted it and finally landed on where we're at now and really, really happy with it. Talk a little bit more about that because Ashley, I have seen her in action and we have done podcasts with her. So we did a show with her, didn't we? Yeah, we did more than one with Davidson Reserve and all the stuff down at Pennington. And mm-hmm. she'll just sit there and she'll take 10 barrels and be like, all right, I get three profiles. But this one's a single barrel. This one's out of the back. Like this one's out of the mix. She's like, I get a grapefruit IPA from this. I get maple syrup from this. And then you put it together. And if I blend it all together, you get a grapefruit IPA in the nose and maple syrup on the taste. Like, tell me about what it's like working with Ashley because it's kind of crazy. It's Yeah, it's insane, honestly, what she can do. You know, to see her in action and in the chemistry mindset or whatever you want to call it and, and sort of her in the lab. If I would have known that you could do that back in, in high school, I would have paid a hell of a lot more attention to <laughs> you know, that you could you could uh, put booze together and figure out what you want them to taste like. But, um, you know, it, it's the same thing. Like I kind of went to her and said, look, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a bourbon drinker, but I by no means a bourbon connoisseur and, you know, I'm not going to pretend to be. So, you know, I'm going to really kind of lean on you here, Ashley, and, and sort of, you know, I'll tell you what I think as far as, you know, whether it's hot or it's not or this or that. And But when it comes to the, the notes and, and sort of what we're looking for, you know, that's that's where I think you shine through. And uh, yeah, that's where she kind of went and was like, she put these blends together. And she's like, you know, I, I pulled a barrel from this row and this Rick house and this thing like way the hell out there. And, you know, it's got this. And then I got one that's on the bottom floor next to the door that's, you know, totally different and, you know, tastes way younger. But if we put them together, you know, here's what we got. And to your point, it's like her descriptions of everything was just unreal. So, you know, she'd be like, what do you, what do you, what do you taste? I'm like, fuck, I don't know. Like, <laughs> what do you taste? Like, you're like, ah, it's creme brulee with blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, that's exactly. That's exactly. Yeah, exactly. Well, and that's the thing too. Whatever <laughs> somebody yeah. gives you, that's why you don't listen to somebody else's tasting notes right before you sip. Cause mm-hmm. it's like, I get creme brulee and it's like, Oh, I didn't know what that was, but that's creme brulee like now. And so whatever <laughs> yeah. they tell you they got, you're going to yeah. get two seconds later. A hundred percent. We used to do these, are we still do them where they're like the kind of bourbon 101, like masterclass type things where we, we'd get a bunch of people on there and zoom and, and, you know, for the first 10, 15 minutes of it would always be super awkward because we'd be tasting it and you'd ask people what they, what they taste and you know, what they know is and this and that. And no one wants to speak up, but then it's like, after they get a few drinks in them and everything, then you can't get anybody to be quiet. And it's like, <laughs> they're like, I taste this. And it's like the next person's got, you know, some off the wall description that they have too. So it ends up being fun. But yeah, you know, Ashley, you know, back to her, she is a wizard, you know, I think in, in, you know, each one of these times with these single barrels and stuff too, we'll pull all the samples and, you know, like you mentioned, she'll taste it and she's like, no, this one, this one isn't it. Like it's got to go, got to go in the blend and it's got to do this or it's got to be that. And yeah, we, we, we've sort of each time we've pulled anywhere from 20 to 25 barrels each time. And, and, uh, you know, we, we sort of, pull several samples and i mean probably 70 80 percent of the time we end up using them for for single barrels but the other 20 30 percent we we push off and know that uh they aren't uh single barrel quality and we'll use them for something else nice going through this whole thing and we know yeah you're a pandemic brand and that happened but what was the hardest thing about getting off hours going Ooh, it's um i think the just the standard like if you look at a lot of brands and, and everything has kind of been done over the years the the standard playbook of sort of what we talked about before of you know getting it on the back bar getting it on a cocktail menu hitting the local liquor stores and sort of you know getting liquid to lips we'll call it is sort of you know is the blocking and tackling that you have to do in a lot of cases that we never got a chance to do so we were relying on social media and relying on these things to make the brand sort of, you know, speak to people in a certain way or relatable to their lifestyle. 
you know, hopefully, you know, persuade them enough to go spend 40, 45, 50 bucks on a bottle and at a time where the world shut down and you don't know what the hell is going on. So I think it was a little bit of a blessing and a curse where the success that we did have in sort of social media and digital ads and all the other kind of stuff that we had to do to build awareness was cool knowing that, you know, we didn't have that whole other side of the in-person traditional playbook that everyone uses. But, you know, it's sort of come full circle now where now we've gotten all these places and we've done all this stuff and people are like, oh, yeah, we've heard about your brand. We've seen your brand. We've read about your brand. And it's like, it's almost like we did it ass backwards, (laughs) really, to like, you know, now all of a sudden we're getting all this in-person, you know, feedback and all this, you know, opportunity to get it out there after the fact. So it's already in the BevMos and the totals and the this and the that. You know, and then they're like, oh, well, I've had your brand before, but I never even really knew much about it. I never had it in a cocktail or anything like that. So, you know, it was difficult really just to get it out there. But at the same time, now all of a sudden, it's like it sort of paved this path for us that, you know, it sort of forced us down this path, to be honest. But at the same time, it, it worked. And, you know, now we're just kind of feeding the, feeding the fire a little bit with it. It's like you built the following before you had the fans. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Instead of, you know, fans build the following. It was like you had this right. whole thing where social media works for you. People know the brand awareness was not your issue. It was getting liquor to lips and then having those people go, you know what? Like, I know who you are. Just like me. I, you know, everybody's like, you look like someone I know. Like, you look like Toby from This Is Us. <laughs> or like, you look like the dude. Who's the guy you say I look like all the time, Zeke? I don't know. You say I look like that that guy on the the guy who's now jacked. On my name is Earl. Oh, the tuna. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you like the tuna from Blow. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> he got jacked. I got jacked. It works out, right? But yeah. like, you know, everybody's always like, "I'm aware of you, but I'm not a fan of you. I don't know who you are." No, I think you you're spot on with the the awareness too and seeing it. But I think it's it's surprising because a lot of times. You know, you you're, you know, you're going to talk to the retailers or you're going to talk to the distributors and you're showing them all the branding and the this and the that and social media and stuff. And it's great. But, you know, any there's a lot of brands that do that. And it's like, well, you know, your brand can really stick out. But if the product tastes like shit, then, you know, then you got an issue. I think that's where we've seen a lot of people be sort of pleasantly surprised where they think it's just like a branding play and it's a lot of bells and whistles and, you know, we're just doing everything there. But when they actually try it, you're like, oh, wow, like that's actually, you know, way better than what we thought. And then, you know, when you have the, you know, whether it's San Francisco or SIP or New York or, you know, any of these awards competitions to get into, you know, we've gotten gold or double gold and, and, you know, every single one of them. So it's nice to have sort of that third party validation to, to where we can say, look, yeah, the brand is there, the marketing is there, you know, and the juice is good. So we feel like we're, we're checking all the necessary boxes to, to hopefully, you know, not have an issue with people taking it and putting it on the shelf. And, and now, you know, the hard part is getting people to pull it off the shelf. And, and we think that we're hopefully doing a pretty good job of, of doing that as well. Yeah, it's definitely, you know, the, where the, the marketing play comes in. And then, you know, like we talked about early on, it's not like there aren't plenty of people getting MGP juice. And, you mm-hmm. know, some folks know it, some don't. I honestly think more don't know it than we would probably give them credit for. To me, like with the marketing play, I almost relate it to like my day job being in the pharmacy. If somebody comes back and asks you a question. Hey, what do you recommend for this? All right, give me a second. Come out there, like go through this and that with them. Like, all right, well, if it was me, I'd probably get this or maybe that. And then after like my whole spiel, I can explain everything to them. Well, what about this thing over here? Because I saw that on TV. That's what I was thinking about getting. It's like, well, why the hell did you even waste my time? You were just going to get when you came in here. Like, there's nothing more aggravating. But to that, though, you know, it speaks to what, like, the marketing side of it. Mm-hmm. You came in and asked me a question. I gave you five minutes worth of my time and, like, my actual opinion. But the whole time, because of the marketing, you knew where you were going. Like, so once it's in someone's mind, especially people trying to be in and out of stores quicker, too, mm-hmm. during all the pandemic stuff, like, nobody wanted to come into the store and linger in an aisle for 20 minutes just mulling over, like, well, which one of these am I going to buy? Like, mm. sure. I know going in, I'm going to grab it, get to the counter, pay, and I'm out of there. Like, I'm not having anybody breathe on me more than I have to. (laughs) Exactly. And 99% of it was like, do you have Jack, Jim, or Tito's? (laughs) 100%. Yeah, it was all brands that everybody already knew of. They were well aware of what they were getting. So, yeah, to be a a newcomer brand to come in there, and they're like, 
yeah, we seen you. We saw you on you know Instagram or Facebook or this or that, but we've never tasted it. And I don't know if I want to spend it. I can go over here and grab a bottle of Jack, but I know what it tastes like. I know what I'm getting and everything. And it, you know, it's money spent. So definitely an uphill climb. But um, but even that on. being said, right? I mean, you're putting out five to seven year. What's the price of the single barrel? The single barrel, I think, depending on the market, it's anywhere from like sixty four ninety nine, so sixty five bucks to seventy five bucks. You're getting seven year cast strength. MGP for 65 to 79 bucks. Like that ain't bad compared to what some of this stuff goes for in the market, which is crazy. Like hats off to you for wanting to make a brand. I think it's also like the age demographic. Yes. I mean, I joke where I said this brand is way too cool for me. There's no secret you are targeting a younger demographic and trying to get those younger bourbon drinkers. It's just not cost effective for your brand to go ahead and make something like this 80, 90 bucks because then you're going to miss out like those younger drinkers are poor and yeah yeah <laughs> yeah exactly right i think you know we're going for the 25 26 to you know 40 year old i mean we probably even should have shouldn't put a cap on the the higher end there but like you know starting at 25 26 bucks it's like you know maybe some of these folks are in their career and you know who knows what what sort of money they're making but you know they're, they're sort of starting to figure it out a little bit and i think that the price point that we sort of chose and, and really for like the everyday product and the single barrel is something that I thought that if it's really good juice and the packaging is there and you bought it for 40 bucks or 45 bucks for the, the everyday 95 proof and you spent, you know, 65, 70 bucks on the single barrel, that if you liked it, that you'd come back and you'd think that you were getting something that was better than what the price point was and that packaging was better than so you felt like you're getting a 60 70 dollar bottle for you know less than what it is you felt like you're getting a deal on it same thing for the single barrel was like if we're putting it out there and you know some of these brands are selling it for 80 90 100 bucks same shit you know for the same juice for the most part and they're charging that like i get it if you can get that dollar that's great for your business cool but at the same time you're taking a big risk on you know whether or not people are willing to pay that right up front like can you get someone to pull it off the shelf for that if they know what it is and it was the same thing for us it was like i'd rather put it at a price point where if someone pulled it off the shelf and they liked it they're thinking they're getting it for a hell of a deal if they pulled it off the shelf and they didn't like it then at least didn't sting as much of like damn i just spent a shit ton of money and i don't like it now you know whatever i'm giving it to <laughs> my friends or whatever it is but like you know, something where it didn't, you know, burn your pockets too much. So yeah, I, I felt like where we're at hits the demographic that we're going after and, and, you know, it's not pricing ourselves out of it. Definitely see that side of it. And, you know, probably a year, two years ago, agreed way more, but then where things are now with the boom and everything, I feel like if you're looking at it from a business standpoint, you know, every time you go to buy from the broker, price probably the same as it was the last time. Might even be younger, like sourcing bottles, everything else. Sure. There's so many nuances have popped up and I feel like, well, if I'm forecasting in my business plan, I don't want to have to like every time somebody goes in the store to buy a bottle every three to six months, hey, it's five dollars more. <laughs> it's five dollars more. Like these folks are sprinkling sure. diamond the shit out of me. Sure. But you're just passing along where all your own increases went up. So that's where yeah. I kind of wonder if some folks are, you know, probably a little overzealously forecasting. I mean, do you want to have a consistent price for a couple of years? And maybe your margin goes down a little bit. But again, like we've all seen it anytime they announce the price going up on bookers. How many of those fans raise hell about it? And they're like, why? Same juice. Been making it for how many years? Why is it going up? And there are reasons. Folks just either don't want to accept it or literally don't know. But seeing that perceptive and how the, the public reacts to it, I do kind of wonder from the business side, like, well, which way is better? Or, or how do we even know? Sure. No, you, you know, you bring up a good point because I think that when you don't have your own distillery and your sourcing, yeah, you're at the mercy of what's allocated to other brands, where, you know, what these brokers have, what MGPs that will sell you, what any of these distilleries, you know, if you have a, a new fill contract, anything with them, you know, and it's a scary feeling because you don't necessarily know a year from now, two years from now, three years from now, what the market's going to be, what prices you're going to pay, what you're going to do. And I think that one of the things that I did early on is when I bought the barrels, one, just having the MGP relationships and everything was able to get a you know, kind of a family and friends uh, discount on the barrels. So I knew that from day one, that if I turned around and sold them, that I was going to make, you know, make money off of them. And it's like, okay, well, and I kind of took it as like, I, I purchased the barrels as in one entity of like, this is an asset, like this is an appreciating asset. And I'm going to have these barrels over here. 
And, you know, if I get into the mix of this brand and all of a sudden, you know, life changes or shit hits the fan or whatever, and I you know can't do this anymore, I've always got the barrels that I can kind of fall back on as a safety net or, you know, your backstop. Luckily, the pricing right, you know, about this time last year was when things were starting to get a little hairy, was able to kind of get in on, you know, quite a few barrels and everything from MGP from you know, really kind of five year old or five, four, three, all the way down, like tiered it all the way down to, to basically new fill. And then it was like within two or three months, all of a sudden the pricing skyrocketed, the supply demand issues were, you know, were real. And, you know, for us right now, to your point about increasing pricing, like talking to the distributors, you know, they want to make their margins. They want to make sure that they get what they get. The retailers want to make sure they get what they get. So, you know, I understand that we want to make it a win-win for everybody. But I asked them, like, you know, look, we, we were thinking about bumping up the price a couple bucks because the price of glass and logistics and supply chain, literally everything behind the scenes that, you know, a lot of folks don't think about everything was completely different. And it was, you know, you're buying glass six to eight months out and you're buying two to three times amount that you think you need because you don't even know if you're going to get it on time. And the same thing for cork and for label, and, you know, you name it. So like your cash flow is running the business was totally fucked. Like everything was like, you were trying to pull levers here and there to make sure that everything was good. But when you go to the distributors and you say, hey, here's what we're doing, you know, for the most part, every single one of them was like, look, everyone is doing this right now. The makers, the beams, the this, the that, they're all increasing their pricing. So for you as a smaller brand, you know, up and coming brand, if you want to bump up your pricing, I don't think people are going to think differently of it because everyone else is doing it. And they understand, you know, where the world's at right now and inflation and all this stuff. So it's definitely something that, uh, you know, when we launched California, really, you know, previously we were we were selling direct and now, you know, we're with RDC out here. You know, that was something the very first conversation was like, I don't think our, our FOB is going to be the same thing here as it is in Texas or in Indiana or Tennessee or wherever it be. And uh, so we sort of built that into it. And then for Indiana and some of the other places that it's been the same since the launch, you know, it's going to go up, unfortunately. But, um, you know, hopefully people understand that. It's not us being greedy and, and trying to you know, increase the prices. It's trying to sort of yeah keep everyone happy and, and make sure that everybody's able to, to cover what they need. Totally get that. The question I kind of have piggybacking off of that is, you know, you were lucky enough to get some barrels last year. Long term, are you one of the lucky few that has kind of an ongoing contract? And if you can't say it, it's okay. But like you're shoring up your barrels long term. Do you have those agreements? agreements in place or is it kind of like you're a friend and they're going to take care of you when you need them? Yeah. You know, th- this, this was a conversation I had with, um, with them in January of this year. Uh, I sat down and basically explained to them that that very thing it was like, you know, look right now for the foreseeable future, I've got plenty of inventory. You know, if we really, you know, put our foot on the gas and, and sort of try to sell through everything. Like, you know, if we sold through all of it, we'd be in, you know, really, really good shape. But at the same time, it's, I would say probably the number one thing that keeps me up at night is like, what the hell happens, you know, if four or five years down from the road, you know, you don't have that inventory. And and basically the, the response was like, we got you. Like essentially, and it's kind of like a handshake agreement. And, you know, talking with them, they're like, look, we produce 340 something thousand barrels a year and we have none. We have none, no new fill, no age stuff. It is like, it is there. We are pulling back from startup brands. We are pulling back from other larger brands that have their own distilleries that need the the supplemental barrels because the brands are bigger than their own production capacity. You know, they said, look, like in order for us, we cannot produce anymore. Like we were running three shifts a day, you know, 360 days a year and that's it. And we're not going to, we're not going to invest hundreds of millions of dollars into more space and more equipment and everything too. So, you know, it is like, Hey, we got you, but at the same time, kind of like, do you got me? I don't know. (laughs) Uh, So it's definitely something that the conversations are being had, you know, with others to line off hours with when it comes to barrel inventory, when it comes to bottling operations and sort of everything to really try to streamline everything so that it's all done under one roof versus, kind of where the, the the current strategy is, which 
is worked. But I think that now that the company has grown and you know where we're at, where we're at, it just makes a lot of sense to try to really kind of get all our ducks in a row in a way that really kind of puts us in a great spot, you know, moving forward to where there's not as many, you know, hoops to jump through and, and not as many touch points from different folks that, you know, it just takes a lot more time and, and effort. Well, and what I would say is you're very lucky you have an amazing blender in your back pocket. So say if you do get juice that comes from multiple sources, you can blend them all together in a unique way and have different batches of your whiskey that might all taste a little differently, but you know, might have one thing that kind of ties them all together. So that might be fun too, you know? Yeah. You know, I think that's been, it's something we've talked about too, because you see, you know, you see a lot of brands out there that are sourcing and they're doing their thing and, and they're doing limited releases and they're doing different finishes and, you know, finding cool, creative ways to, to sort of differentiate themselves. And I think that it's something that we've thought a lot about where it's like, I want to get, you know, this really kind of the, the everyday sort of hero product out there and really have that be our sort of flagship. And I think after that, you know, the single barrel is there. Eventually that will go from just a sole barrel pick program to, you know, an everyday single barrel cast strength product that you know, we'll have on the shelf. And I think from there, that's when we want to get creative with sort of limited runs here and there and, and finding ways to just create other products that hopefully keep people coming back for not only that, but for the single barrel and for the the everyday products. But, you know, it was really sort of like, let's walk before we run as far as getting it out there, getting our, our brand awareness, getting our, our, our foundation built. And then from there, try to bring out some more products and, and um, you know, see where it goes from there. Speaking of single barrel, and there's a lot, I mean, you, you've said everything so far. You've said how you got here. You've said how things are right now. You've just given a little bit of a glimpse into the future. I think we should do a little glimpse into our future because we're about to pick a barrel for distribution. Y'all are going to ask us, this will be in Middle Tennessee, Jake, or is it all of Tennessee? I think all of Tennessee, depending on where so we're with best brands in Tennessee, wherever they want to place it as far as these retailers that they cover the whole state so sort of up to them i think as far as how many bottles or how many cases they want to push towards certain areas typically best brands will will sprinkle it out you know there'll be two or three in each store not every store right but like you know the stores that buy off hours is probably where they're gonna be so yeah. if you know a store that likes to buy off hours chances are they're gonna have this pick there so zeke and i have four samples i don't know if you have these samples too you know i have i have one i believe one i was talking to chris before this who would drop up the samples to you yeah, I think I have uh, 64 is the only sample I think that I have that's uh, the same that you guys have. All right. So we have four of them here. We have barrel 3790. It's 108.5 proof. We have barrel 64, which Jake has too. It's 103.6 proof. We have barrel 39. It's 109.1 proof. And we have barrel 3774. It's 105.0 proof. Rather than sit around here, let's just, we used to do a fake tape thing we would pretend that we were fast forwarding through all the tasting bullshit. Like that was shit we pulled in 2016. Everybody knows by now that Zeke and I have tasted through these on our own. We have not talked to each other about it, but we have tasted through these so that the show is not boring to you. I'm just going to go through Zeke. If we could take two out right now and we'll do like one, two, three, go. Well, if we do that, we'll say at the same time, then nobody will hear anything that we either one of us say. I know that's why it'll be fun. <laughs> Now, you tell me the two you'd take out first. Uh, the two 3000 series. I 100% am with you. For the proof on those, all I'll say is I think they're punching above the number you see. And there was a little more kick at the back than I just have gotten into in a while. I didn't really plan or think this out ahead of time, honestly. But but an oak know, kick, the, too. With, well, I was going to say with the uh, the off hours branding theme, et cetera, when I'm in off hours, I'm not trying to have a a pour that I want to think about a ton or has like a big back end that, you know, basically slows me down. Like I just want to enjoy it, drink it and have a, you know, a re relaxing, unwinding time. So at least the past uh, year or more now, like I'm going for the easy guy. Like I, I, I don't need all that in my world all the time. Like it's fun from time to time, but if it's something I'm going to grab, you know, in that, you know, 65, $70 range, I know it's going to be a, a drinker, quote unquote. Like, I just want to drink the damn thing. <laughs> now, Zeke and I have changed our palates over time to like all we really want 
when we do a barrel pick now is just to have a crusher. Like that's the way we call it is it's just, it is good. It is sweet. Like we like the sweet Oak if there's Oak there, but just something sweet and crushable. Let's go on to barrel 39. what do you think about that one? Mr. Baker. I thought there was some fruit on the entry. It was not overly hot and the finish was fair. Fair. It's a fair assessment. I also got a little corn on this one too. A little more corn than on some of the other ones. So for 64, I thought that that one was light and fruity on the entry. Times, it almost reminded me of, I don't know which one, but like some flavor of Bubblicious. I tried to think back to being a kid, like, you know, the sports days and like when you picked one out all the time, but been too far back and I can't really put my finger on which one it was, but that was what popped in my head. It was, you know, an old factory memory. And on the back end, it was also just easy, like doesn't throttle you down, you know, no hug, no kick, no, no kind of. You know, char that makes you pucker up. It, it just went down and said, if you want another one, go for it, buddy. You're you're always ready. Nose was kind of, you said Publicious. I got a lot of Jolly Rancher on this nose. At the end of the day, it's sweet. It's fruity. That, you know, if I'm identifying with Jolly Rancher, we're probably getting the same note and it's identifying itself differently to us just because of who we are. The other thing I would say is just had a little bit of complexity, but not in the sense that it overwhelmed you. It was just a really, really good pick. If you drink through these four, for me, if you don't look at 64 and go, ah, that's it. Like it was pretty obvious to me. I don't know about you, Zeke. Yeah, the first time through, just nipped each one. And I was like, all right, 3,000s are out. I'll focus on these other two a little more. And my gut said 64. You know, sometimes you revisit each one two or three times, and eh, maybe the gut wasn't quite right. But as I revisited this, you know, a few times now as we've been talking and uh, shooting the shit and whatnot, I'm still leaning on 64 pretty hard and uh, don't have any remorse or, or regrets going with that one. Yeah, no regrets. <laughs> 64 it is so put it down jake this can go into store how long is it going to take you to get this going it's done you got i would say you get it in two to three weeks all right so this is what i'm going to do i am going to pull back the curtain right here right now zeke and i were going to stay on and do a review tonight so everybody gets to listen to this stuff this is like the most interesting stuff here zeke friday night we're going to record two shows i am going to expedite this one so sorry to the people that have recorded prior to jake but this episode will go out friday just so everyone knows the off hours dad shrink and bourbon pick is going to be in middle tennessee in a couple weeks so look out for it i love the i i tasted these four and immediately i was like it's 64 and then i was really bummed because it was close to my college football number but not exactly it i figured you're going to be bummed because 64 is also like my height it's 64 and you're not that tall i'm 63 it's close enough <laughs> But yes, if we were to do a sticker on this one, we could do six four. Like <laughs> or like cruising down the street in a six four would be my kind of like place I would go here because I'm not a narcissist like Zeke and it's not always about me. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always, John. Just a fair amount of the time. Thank you. Jake, we love your brand. We love what you're doing with it. And you have a friend in Dad's Drinking Bourbon all the time. Come on, give us updates. Come out to Nashville, hang out with Chris, hang out with us. And we love to see good things happen to good people. You, you are a fellow Dad Drinking Bourbon, and we love to see your brand doing well and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you, fellas. I appreciate the time. And, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to get this barrel, uh, you know, in the state of Tennessee and, and, and out the door from there. And, and uh, I will definitely take you up on the offer. I'm hoping to get back to Tennessee to see you know sometime here in the fall so when i do i will make sure to give you a heads up and, and we'll go uh we'll grab a bottle of this and, and see where it goes from there please do in the meantime everybody can find off hours at off hours.com i think is it off hours.com or off uh, hours drink off hours. yeah drink off hours drinkoffhours.com they are on all of the socials all that other good stuff you can find us on facebook at dad's drinking bourbon twitter at bourbon dads instagram at dad's drinking bourbon please leave us an open and honest review just like we leave open and honest reviews about the whiskey we drink zeke baker where else can the folks find us good old nashville tennessee cheers ciao